The word cooperation has been used already many times um, this morning. And with that in mind, I think it's uh, a good time to go to our first panel. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Ren Mingui, who is Assistant Director General of UHC at Communicable Diseases and Non-Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization. Um, Elizabeth Vidapas, who is Director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and May Abdul Wahab, who is Director um, at the Division of Human Health for the International Atomic a Energy Agency. Please welcome them all to the stage. <laughs> Do take a seat. Um, so before we get to discussing how these agencies can do exactly that, provide this level of uh, cooperation and oversight at a global level rather than just simply a local, as we've just heard, or national level. Um, before we get to that, let's hear some video messages. First of all, from the WHO Director General. Your Excellency President Nazarbayev, Excellency Mrs. Hakobian, Excellency Mrs. Kabore, Excellency Mrs. Nazarbayeva, Your Royal Highness Princess Dina, Honorable Ministers and Guests. By the time I finish speaking, nearly 100 people will have cancer. The vast majority do not have access to effective, affordable cancer services that could prevent, diagnose, treat, or palliate their disease. We cannot tolerate a world of profound cancer inequalities. Last year, WHO launched two major cancer initiatives to eliminate cervical cancer and to expand cancer care for children. No girl should go unvaccinated and no woman should go unscreened for cervical cancer. No parent should have to decide if they have the money to pay for their child's cancer care. At the United Nations General Assembly last month, world leaders came together to endorse the political declaration on universal health coverage. We call on all countries to invest in primary health care for cancer prevention and early detection. And we call on all countries to ensure that services for treatment and palliative care are included in benefit packages as part of their journey toward this universal health coverage. Generations of cancer patients depend on us. WHO is committed to working with all countries to beat cancer. I wish you every success and I thank you. Now, we also have a statement from the Acting Director General of the IAEA. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the International Atomic Energy Agency is very pleased to be part of this World Cancer Leaders Summit. We strongly welcome the recent adoption of the political declaration on universal health coverage, and in particular, the commitment to strengthen efforts to address non-communicable diseases such as cancer. Cancer control in developing countries is a strong focus of the IA's work. For many years, we have worked to improve access to nuclear medicine, radiotherapy, and dosimetry services. We provide training for radiation oncologists, medical physicists, radiologists, and other professionals. We help countries to set up facilities for radiotherapy and nuclear medicine, and to acquire equipment for diagnosing and treating cancer. We are conducting studies on how to improve survival in children with cancer through nutritional interventions, aided by the use of nuclear and, and isotopic techniques. With partners such as the WHO, the IAEA helps governments to put national plans in place to offer comprehensive cancer care to their people. We help them draft so-called bankable documents so they can obtain funding from lending institutions for cancer projects. The IAEA's work, together with the WHO and other valued partners represented here, saves lives. But the challenges remain daunting. In too many developing countries, access to radiotherapy treatment is either non-existent or woefully inadequate. As a result, huge number of people die of conditions that would often be treatable if their countries had the necessary equipment and facilities 
and enough well-trained medical professionals. There is an estimated shortage of 5,000 radiotherapy machines throughout the world. To meet the cancer needs of developing countries, many thousands of radiation oncologists, medical physicists, dosimetrists, and radiation therapists need to be trained. I am pleased that governments have increasingly recognized the gravity of the global cancer crisis. I welcome the commitment in the Declaration on Universal Health Coverage to improve access to health technologies, which are particularly important in the cancer field, and to promote stronger partnerships with the private sector. This year, we at the IAEA opened our first linear accelerator facility, which was generously made available for our dosimetry lab by the manufacturer. This greatly enhances our services to help ensure the quality and safety of treatment received by cancer patients throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I am confident that this summit will help to increase awareness of the vital need to include cancer treatment in universal health coverage. The IA is committed to working with all of you to help ensure that all the people of the world gain access to the highest standards of cancer care. Thank you. Well, I think there's a couple of very, very strong statements there. Uh, let's start with the World Health Organization, um, if we may, um, Dr. Mengui, and ask why is it that universal health care is seen as uh, such a vital part of the infrastructure when it comes to treating cancer? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, uh, Tanya. And also, I would like to extend my uh, uh, appreciation to the host. Uh, the government uh, uh, for this very important event. Uh, regarding the universal health coverage, to my understanding, universal coverage, not completely new, has been rooted in the World Health, uh, health Organization Constitution in, 20, in 1948. So it's, uh, uh, which is... Uh, so there's nothing new, is the it's, point that you're no, making. It's, it's nothing completely new. Let me quote what has been said in WHO Constitution, yeah. if you allow me that um, the enjoyment of a highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, and social condition. That's, of course, is a traditional language of what they mean universal coverage. But like I said, it reflects clearly what they mean, which has been reflected many times in the different documents. Um, so we think the UHC is absolutely our principles to guide our work in WHO for public health issues. And also over the years, we see the government has made multiple commitment regarding universal health coverage in different documents in different occasions. As we hear from the Deputy Prime Minister, we have very strong commitment in Alamata declarations on primary care. We see that commitment has been reflected in the Astana declaration on PHC last year. And of course, it's great signals. We see absolutely in 2015, the all member states, when they talk about the new sustainable development goal we call SDG, the UHC is one of the indicators has been reflected and agreed in this very important document to guide the whole development of coming of 15 years. Of course, the big achievement we have has been convinced in the uh, universal health coverage is U U United Nations General Assembly, which convinced just a couple of weeks ago. But clearly, we see is, as you said, it's not completely new, but this kind of reaffirmation of commitment from government and the partners is such fundamental because it triggers such shift dialogue when the people talking about the health from the disease special programs to the universal health coverage. That means people talking about system strengthening, which can be absolutely fundamental issues for all the country, for all the people, whatever they leaves, they can absolutely free from the financial burdens without financial harness when they need services for health. Mm. Why is it so important in the context of cancer? Because as we hear, cancer is the second leading cause of death globally. Yeah. We see that cancer caused about um, 
1.6 million deaths globally by estimation in 2018. You can't talk about UHC without talking about cancer prevention, without talking cancer early diagnosis, without talking cancer, the palliative care. That's the issue why we have to take the cancer, probably as one well of the demonstration project, where the USC can be absolutely serious, taking into consideration by the government, by the United Nations, and by the partners. Mm. So it works both ways, in, in that sense, that it's a demonstration of how powerful UHC can be. Um, so where is the WHO supporting countries in, in this context? Um, clearly, WHO is one of the leading agencies in the UN family. We're working with all the partners. That's why I'm so happy with uh, our partner agency who's sitting uh, on the stage. But clearly, we, first of all, we have to work with countries, support the country, have their national strategy on USC, and also to make sure when they talk about USC, the cancer and other major health issues have to be embedded in this dialogue. And also, we support the country about what that means major essential priority intervention for cancer, early diagnosis, prevention, care, treatments, and uh, this kind of issues. And also, we generate a lot of tools to help cancer, help government when they look at the cost and about the cancer treatment. Because they hear many countries will say, oh my goodness, probably it's too uh, costly of a cancer. But actually, we have many documents and the models to help the governments and the country see whether the cost is, is reasonable for them to take care in the yeah. budget. And also we launched two very important global strategy and initiative, as you hear from Dr. Tedros' speech, actually one global initiative on about cancer, as a childhood cancer, we also launched uh, our global initiative to eliminate vesicle, uh, cervical cancer. And we're, we're going to develop our global strategy of a cervical cancer on, in the coming executive board and assembly next year for the board member, for all the uh, member states to endorse and to elaborate and then to implement in the future. Right, so that's the WHO. Let's come to the International Agency uh, for Research on Cancer. And, and Elizabeth, to you. Where do you see, or where does IARC see, um, universal health coverage fitting with the, the, the trying to solve some of these problems around cancer? Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much for this interview and also for the organizers for this important event. IARC sees universal health care as part of the solution of a very important problem uh, globally. As Dr. Ming Hui pointed out, we have over 18 million new cancer cases per year and about 10 million deaths. That's absolutely immense and it's causing a tremendous burden in the healthcare systems all across the world. Mm. IARC has a very important role to play, basically setting the scenario, understanding how many cases there are in the world. We are working with almost all countries in the world to understand the burden and determine with high quality how many cases occur, how many deaths occur, and what we should do together to fight against it. Besides this mapping exercise, which is very important for priority setting, we, we are also doing a lot of research to understand how best to tackle cancer in terms of primary prevention, secondary prevention as well. So we do a lot of research to understand what's effective and cost effective in cancer prevention globally. Hmm. And we've sort of hinted at it really, but in, in, in the solutions um, that are being put forward for cancer and UHC, the two kind of support each other, don't they? That, that's where you're getting to with it as Absolutely. well. So despite the fact that you're coming from the angle of, of research on cancer, obviously, that in of itself is supportive of the idea of UHC. Absolutely, because... Uh, and can I'm help set it up, presumably. Sorry, yes. I'll stop interrupting you in a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. So all decisions in the healthcare system, they need to be evidence-based. We And where does the evidence come from? From science. So we need a reliable organization that provides good quality science about what's effective and cost-effective for cancer prevention globally. And that's what we are for, to working with WHO, IE, or other partners. So where specifically do you see the linkages between the two, just to pin you down on this, between your work and, and UHC? How do you specifically see the two can work together? 
I can give you many examples. Uh, for example, the, some of the research we have done in HPV, human papilloma virus uh, vaccination, that we have started this research many decades ago. But right now, what has been recommended until very recently was three doses of the vaccine. And all research has indicated that, that maybe two doses are enough. And this is what now WHO is recommending throughout the world. And we are doing now further research that might indicate that up to one dose might be sufficient to protect against human papilloma virus. This really can guide the universal health care decrease costs for all governments and increase equality as it will allow many more people to benefit for this vaccine. So that gives you an idea or gives us an idea really of just how impactful UHC could be on treating cancer and diagnosing it and preventing it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there are many other examples. Uh, also, uh, another example is the example on cancer screening, cervical cancer screening. Yeah. So cervical cancer is a preventable disease, full stop. No woman, no woman in the world should die of cervical cancer. This is a disease that can be eliminated, and therefore, together with WHO, we have this initiative in, in eliminate cervical cancer as a, as a public health problem. And this is where uh, universal healthcare can really have an absolutely fundamental role in eliminating, in, during our lifetime, this important disease. Okay, thank you very much indeed uh, for the moment. May, let's come to you and talk about the IAEA and ask you really the same question. What is your view? How does the IAEA see UHC? Well, I think the main thing that we need to think about is in terms of nuclear technology, since that's the area that the IAEA is a focal point worldwide. And um, till today, there are many, um, as we heard from, our, um, uh, from Mr. Cornell Fruta, there's a lot of lack of facilities worldwide. And even uh, countries that have facilities, there's a big gap in what's needed versus what's there. So it's basically an opportunity for us to integrate this nuclear technology um, opportunity into UHC. Um, another important thing is the opening of a discussion in terms of what uh, costs we have. The perception uh, is mistaken perception that it's completely um, too expensive for many countries. And what we found is that uh, looking at the costs and being able to discuss it, we found that there are different packages and ways that we can implement in a uh, stepwise way uh, through, we have a document that just came out, a milestone document that uh, gives that um, kind of uh, roadmap, um, implementing these important technologies. So radiotherapy, for example, 50% of all cancer patients need radiotherapy. It's important for cure, it's important all the way to palliation. Not having it is extremely um, detrimental to the country. Cervix cancer, as we heard, is, is an important initiative worldwide. So if it's cervix cancer, anything beyond the very early stage requires radiation therapy. So it's our opportunity to do that. We found that two, $2 per capita is sufficient to bring a 50% coverage up to full coverage on average worldwide. And the subsequent cost of treatment in low middle income countries is a third of what you would see in high income countries. So in the end, we looked at many of these issues and we found that, that it's something that should be doable. Um, so we would like to be able to take that opportunity for that discussion and to in incorporate it within health uh, systems and also through the cancer care continuum. Presumably, though, there's a, a little bit of the, the upfront cost, I'm assuming, uh, and when you say it's per capita. Yes. Um, but what, what role can the IAEA play here actively? You've so, clearly done some very fundamental research. Yes. <coughs> so, so the IAEA uh, plays a significant uh, role. We've been doing it for almost 60 years in these areas. And um, we have a unique expertise in nuclear technologies and health. So for example, from in assessing the gaps, we work through um, our databases. We have significant databases looking at infrastructure, both in radiotherapy, nuclear medicine, radiology, that can help look at that, health economics analyses that we can help countries with. Um, but we also have missions like impact missions that we do in combination with, of course, WHO and IARC and other um, co colleagues. 
And this can assess the gap across the board, help countries plan better. Um, and then after that, to help them get bankable documents prepared and, other, and help them with their um, cancer plans, etc. But then beyond that, we have in the implementation part, whether it's human resources or whether it's infrastructure and technology, we have programs to support that. So with human resources, we can provide long-term uh, uh, training for you know, residents, etc. We, uh, we have educational, large IT-based data, um, uh, e-learning and other uh, opportunities, even virtual tumor boards. So actually, from the policy through the implementation, we can help them set up cancer centers, um, ra radiation therapy and nuclear medicine part of it, and we have guidelines to make sure that people are able to move forward in that direction very well. And then once we set up all of these uh, opportunities for treatment, we have to make sure it's quality because it's not good to have these centers without having good quality. So quality assurance is a big part. As you heard in the speech earlier from RDG, we have uh, a large uh, service kind of lab, dosimetry lab, that provides calibration and audits throughout the world to countries to ensure that they have good quality. We have quality assurance missions and methodologies and many ways to make sure that this kind of technology is done the right way. And then the last thing I wanted to mention quickly is research. It's not enough to, to stop and, and, and do what we do today. We always have to look into the future. So if we look at the gaps that we have, they're huge. So how are we gonna decrease them? Well, one way is resource sparing. We do resource sparing research which allows us to, for example, you know, uh, treat one week instead of three weeks in a randomized multi-institutional trial <coughs> of glioblastoma multiforme, for example. We found that elderly frail patients don't need the three weeks. So that helps the patients because it's less going back and forth to the center, but it helps the center. They can treat three times as many patients. So some of this research or looking at interventions to make sure that they're cost effective. If we want to educate people a certain way, let's say contouring tumors, we want to be able to know that this is useful and worthwhile and effective and sustainable. So we have research that looks at that specifically. Patterns of care research and many other areas. If, uh, yeah, silence my mic because I was coughing a little bit. Are you finding that when you go to governments with this research that it really helps expedite the process? Well, it, it can help in terms of discussions with, um, you know, colleagues in ministries of health and stuff. Yeah. So to be able to uh, provide data. Yeah. And now we even have uh, modeling to look at, uh, let's say, uh, specific country interventions. Like, for example, uh, if a country has a high incidence of lung cancer, whether or not they need uh, PET CTs and how effective and how costly it is based on their patterns of cancer within the country. So we, we offer a lot of support from a technical perspective. Yeah, you're nodding there. As obviously, that, that's how the WHO sees it as well, that governments really need to be given this type of information really to help them along the path. And of course, it's the economics of it, as, as we've been hearing. No, absolutely. I think that this kind of joint uh, collaboration on research innovation is absolutely important. That can make the government's decision making is really based on the strong evidence and the data. Yeah. And clearly, as I hear too many questions about the cost of uh, uh, dealing with uh, the cancer, but they really take the advantage of such innovation and research maybe this kind of investment on cancer will be not costly in the budget. Because I hear so many sort of challenge questions. Okay, okay, I'm going to build new fancy hospital, tertiary hospital for cancer. Probably it's not correct. Because many intervention and uh, priority intervention can be absolutely delivered in primary care based on the data and research. So this kind of information absolutely can make the decision makers in the country to absolutely fully you know, uh, ready to stand up and working on the cancer. Yes, Elizabeth, you're nodding there as well. It, it is exactly precisely what governments do, not just the fact that they do something. Absolutely. And I mean, governments have really a, a, sometimes a difficult task, right? And to help them, we have developed a tool to tailor made initiatives and to decide what's cost effective. So, together with WHO, IARC has developed this tool for priority setting. And we are going to be dis discussing this tool this afternoon in much more detail together with Dr. Philip Melhus and Andrea Ibaui. 
How optimistic are all of you? I'd like to ask all of you this question about where we are in this path. Are you feeling that governments are listening, that they feel this is an investment that they want and can make? Or do you feel still that we're, we're, we're too close to the beginning of this process? Any thoughts, May? Yes, I think, I think the exciting thing is that uh, we're working a bit more efficiently than we used to. Right. Uh, collaborations, whether on the in international level through uh, initiatives like the UN Joint Program on Cervix Cancer, which six organizations are working on and other partners on the ground, many other initiatives that are ongoing, and closer collaboration to make sure that we do this in a comprehensive manner and we don't repeat what others are doing. So I think yeah. we're working more efficiently, and that's... Uh, I'd underline efficiently because we think of universal health coverage in, in, in means of its excessive cost, but if we make some savings and we work better, I think we're, we're, we'll be able to do it and we use data, so it has to be data driven. So we already see very good initiatives and collaborations that are really becoming um, very common, I guess, and, and more effective. Yes, so I think I'm very positive about that. Excellent, yes. From W aspect, we're also very positive about the progress. As we hear from uh, um, Johannes, the Princess uh, Diane Mirrors, this love country already stepped up and you have a very good progress. Of course, needing more sort of evidence and uh, support from UN agency to make sure they can make the right decision on the right areas. But the point is, Actually, especially from WHO, WHO is member uh, states driven organization. Yeah. We just respond to the, the country's call and the people's call. We not just initiate some global uh, initiative on cancer without some clear request from the country. The all the requests coming from country, because country need WHO to provide technical support to eliminate the cervical cancer. Because country need to deal with the childhood cancer as our priority on their agenda. That's why they need the WHO and the other UNGs to provide technical support in this very important development. So I'm very confident because I know this request from cancer. We have to facilitate the country to make the right choice in the right areas. Just a final thought on, on the speed of progress and how happy or unhappy you are with how things are progressing. I'm, 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 I'm happy, but I, I would like to be you happier. Could be happier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so yeah. I think what's important to make very clear is that our research has shown that up to 50% of all cancer cases can be prevented. It varies from country to country, from 30 something to well, a little bit over 50, but it's immense. So most of the can cancer burden is preventable. And actually we have the tools how to prevent them. What we really need to do is, is to go to the field and, and do so. And that's what, what we should do together. Here. Thank you very much indeed. Very positive note to end it there. Thank you. I will let our panelists go. Thank you um, and leave the stage.